Around the World in 80 Days by Jules Verne. Chapter 1 In which Phileas Fogg and Passepartout accept each other, the one as master, the other as man. Mr. Phileas Fogg lived in 1872 at number 7 Seville Row, Burlington Gardens, the house in which Sheridan died in 1814. He was one of the most noticeable members of the Reform Club, though he seemed always to avoid attracting attention, an enigmatical personage about whom little was known, except that he was a polished man of the world. People said that he resembled Byron, at least that his head was Byronic, but he was a bearded, tranquil Byron, who might live on a thousand years without growing old. Certainly an Englishman, it was more doubtful whether Phileas Fogg was a Londoner. He was never seen on change, nor at the bank, nor in the counting rooms of the city. No ships ever came into London docks of which he was the owner. He had no public employment. He had never been entered at any of the inns of court, either at Temple or Lincoln's Inn or Gray's Inn nor had his voice ever resounded in the court of chancery, or in the exchequer, or on the Queen's Beach, or the ecclesiastical courts. He certainly was not a manufacturer, nor was he a merchant or a gentleman farmer. His name was strange to the scientific and learned societies, and he never was known to take part in the sage deliberations of the Royal Institution, or the London Institution, the Artisans' Association, or the Institution of Arts and Sciences. He belonged, in fact, to none of the numerous societies which swarm in the English capital, from the harmonic to that of the entomologists, founded mainly for the purpose of abolishing pernicious insects. Phileas Fogg was a member of the Reform, and that was all. The way in which he got admission to this exclusive club was simple enough. He was recommended by the Barings, with whom he had an open credit. His checks were regularly paid at sight from his account current, which was always flush. Was Phileas Fogg rich? Undoubtedly. But those who knew him best could not imagine how he had made his fortune, and Mr. Fogg was the last person to whom to apply for the information. He was not lavish, nor, on the contrary, avaricious, for whenever he knew that money was needed for a noble, useful, or benevolent purpose— he supplied it quietly and sometimes anonymously. He was, in short, the least communicative of men. He talked very little, and seemed all the more mysterious for his taciturn manner. His daily habits were quite open to observation, but whatever he did was so exactly the same thing that he had always done before that the wits of the curious were fairly puzzled. Had he traveled? It was likely, for no one seemed to know the world more familiarly. There was no spot so secluded that he did not appear to have an intimate acquaintance with it. He often corrected, with a few clear words, the thousand conjectures advanced by members of the club as to lost and unheard-of travelers, pointing out the true probabilities, and seeming as if gifted with a sort of second sight, so often did events justify his predictions. He must have traveled everywhere, at least in the spirit, it was at least certain that Phileas Fogg had not absented himself from London for many years. Those who were honored by a better acquaintance with him than the rest declared that nobody could pretend to have ever seen him anywhere else. His sole pastimes were reading the papers and playing whist. He often won at this game, which, as a silent one, harmonized with his nature. But his winnings never went into his purse, being reserved as a fund for his charities. Mr. Fogg played not to win, but for the sake of playing. The game was, in his eyes, a contest, a struggle with a difficulty, yet a motionless, unwearying struggle, congenial to his tastes. Phileas Fogg was not known to have either wife or children, which may happen to the most honest people, either relatives or near friends, which is certainly more unusual. He lived alone in his house in Seville Row, whither none penetrated. A single domestic sufficed to serve him. He breakfasted and dined at the club, at hours mathematically fixed, in the same room, at the same table, never taking his meals with other members, much less bringing a guest with him, and went home at exactly midnight, only to retire at once to bed. 
He never used the cozy chambers which the reform provides for its favored members. He passed ten hours out of the twenty-four in Seville Row, either in sleeping or making his toilet. When he chose to take a walk it was with a regular step in the entrance hall with its mosaic flooring, or in the circular gallery with its dome supported by twenty red porphyry ionic columns and illumined by blue painted windows. When he breakfasted or dined all the resources of the club, its kitchens and pantries, its buttery and dairy, aided to crowd his table with their most succulent stores. He was served by the gravest waiters, in dress coats and shoes with swan-skin soles, who proffered the viands in special porcelain and on the finest linen. Club decanters of a lost mold contained his sherry, his port, and his cinnamon-spiced claret, while his beverages were refreshingly cooled with ice, brought at great cost from the American lakes. If to live in this style is to be eccentric, it must be confessed that there is something good in eccentricity. The mansion in Seville Row, though not sumptuous, was exceedingly comfortable. The habits of its occupant were such as to demand but little from the sole domestic, but Phileas Fogg required him to be almost superhumanly prompt and regular. On this very second of October he had dismissed James Forster because that luckless youth had brought him shaving water at eighty-four degrees Fahrenheit instead of eighty-six, and he was awaiting his successor, who was due at the house between eleven and half-past. Phileas Fogg was seated squarely in his armchair, his feet close together like those of a grenadier on parade, his hands resting on his knees his body straight, his head erect. He was steadily watching a complicated clock which indicated the hours, the minutes, the seconds, the days, the months, and the years. At exactly half-past eleven, Mr. Fogg would, according to his daily habit, quit Seville Row and repair to the reform. A rap at this moment sounded on the door of the cozy apartment where Phileas Fogg was seated, and James Forster, the dismissed servant, appeared. The new servant, said he. A young man of thirty advanced and bowed. You are a Frenchman, I believe, asked Phileas Fogg. And your name is John? Jean, if monsieur pleases, replied the newcomer. Jean Passepartout, a surname which has clung to me because I have a natural aptness for going out of one business into another. I believe I'm honest, monsieur, but to be outspoken I've had several trades. I've been an itinerant singer, a circus rider, when I used to vault like Leotard and dance on a rope like Blondine. Then I got to be a professor of gymnastics so as to make better use of my talents, and then I was a sergeant fireman at Paris and assisted at many a big fire. But I quitted France five years ago, and wishing to taste the sweets of domestic life took service as a valet here in England." Finding myself out of place, and hearing that Monsieur Phileas Fogg was the most exact and settled gentleman in the United Kingdom, I have come to Monsieur in the hope of living with him a tranquil life, and forgetting even the name of Passepartout. Passepartout suits me, responded Mr. Fogg. You are well recommended to me. I hear a good report of you. You know my conditions? Yes, Monsieur. Good. What time is it? Twenty-two minutes after eleven, returned Passepartout, drawing an enormous silver watch from the depths of his pocket. You are too slow, said Mr. Fogg. Pardon me, monsieur, it is impossible. You are four minutes too slow. No matter, it's enough to mention the error. Now, from this moment, twenty-nine minutes after eleven a.m., this Wednesday, second October, you are in my service. Phileas Fogg got up took his hat in his left hand, put it on his head with an automatic motion, and went off without a word. Passepartout heard the street door shut once. It was his new master going out. He heard it shut again. It was his predecessor, James Forster, departing in his turn. Passepartout remained alone in the house in Seville Row. End of chapter 1 Chapter 2 
in which Passepartout is convinced that he has at last found his ideal. Faith, muttered Passepartout, somewhat flurried, I've seen people at Madame Tassot as lively as my new master. Madame Tassot's people, let it be said, are of wax, and are much visited in London. Speech is all that is wanting to make them human. During his brief interview with Mr. Fogg, Passepartout had been carefully observing him. He appeared to be a man about forty years of age, with fine, handsome features, and a tall, well-shaped figure. His hair and whiskers were light, his forehead compact and unwrinkled, his face rather pale, his teeth magnificent. His countenance possessed in the highest degree what physiognomists call repose in action, a quality of those who act rather than talk. Calm and phlegmatic, with a clear eye, Mr. Fogg seemed a perfect type of that English composure which Angelica Kaufman has so skillfully represented on canvas. Seen in the various phases of his daily life, he gave the idea of being perfectly well balanced, as exactly regulated as a Leroy chronometer. Phileas Fogg was, indeed, exactitude personified, and this was betrayed even in the expression of his very hands and feet, for in men, as well as in animals, the limbs themselves are expressive of the passions. He was so exact that he was never in a hurry, was always ready, and was economical alike of his steps and his motions. He never took one step too many, and always went to his destination by the shortest cut. He made no superfluous gestures, and was never seen to be moved or agitated. He was the most deliberate person in the world, yet always reached his destination at the exact moment. He lived alone, and, so to speak, outside of every social relation, and as he knew that in this world account must be taken of friction, and that friction retards, he never rubbed against anybody. As for Passepartout, he was a true Parisian of Paris. Since he had abandoned his own country for England, taking service as a valet, he had in vain searched for a master after his own heart. Passepartout was by no means one of those pert dunces depicted by Molier with a bold gaze and a nose held high in the air. He was an honest fellow, with a pleasant face, lips a trifle protruding, soft-mannered and serviceable, with a good round head, such as one likes to see on the shoulders of a friend. His eyes were blue, his complexion rubicund, his figure almost portly and well-built, his body muscular and his physical powers fully developed by the exercises of his younger days. His brown hair was somewhat tumbled, for while the ancient sculptors are said to have known eighteen methods of arranging Minerva's tresses, Passepartout was familiar with but one of dressing his own. Three strokes of a large tooth comb completed his toilet. It would be rash to predict how Passepartout's lively nature would agree with Mr. Fogg. It was impossible to tell whether the new servant would turn out as absolutely methodical as his master required. Experience alone could solve the question. Passepartout had been a sort of vagrant in his early years, and now yearned for repose. But so far he had failed to find it, though he had already served in ten English houses. But he could not take root in any of these. With chagrin he found his masters invariably whimsical and irregular, constantly running about the country or on the lookout for adventure. His last master, young Lord Longferry, member of Parliament, after passing his nights in the Haymarket taverns, was too often brought home in the morning on policemen's shoulders. Passepartout, desirous of respecting the gentleman whom he served, ventured a mild remonstrance on such conduct, which, being ill-received, he took his leave. Hearing that Mr. Phileas Fogg was looking for a servant, and that his life was one of unbroken regularity, that he neither travelled nor stayed from home overnight, he felt sure that this would be the place he was after. He presented himself and was accepted, as has been seen. At half-past eleven, then, Passepartout found himself alone in the house in Seville Row. He began its inspection without delay, scouring it from cellar to garret. 
So clean, well arranged, solemn a mansion pleased him. It seemed to him like a snail's shell, lighted and warmed by gas, which sufficed for both these purposes. When Passepartout reached the second story, he recognized at once the room which he was to inhabit, and he was well satisfied with it. Electric bells and speaking tubes afforded communication with the lower stories, while on the mantel stood an electric clock, precisely like that in Mr. Fogg's bedchamber, both beating the same second at the same instant. "'That's good. That'll do,' said Passepartout to himself. He suddenly observed, hung over the clock, a card which upon inspection proved to be a program of the daily routine of the house. It comprised all that was required of the servant, from eight in the morning exactly at which our Phileas Fogg rose, till half-past eleven, when he left the house for the Reform Club. All the details of service, the tea and toast at twenty-three minutes past eight, the shaving water at thirty-seven minutes past nine, and the toilet at twenty minutes before ten. Everything was regulated and foreseen that was to be done from half-past eleven a.m. till midnight, the hour at which the methodical gentleman retired. Mr. Fogg's wardrobe was amply supplied, and in the best taste. Each pair of trousers, coat, and vest bore a number, indicating the time of year and season at which they were in turn to be laid out for wearing, and the same system was applied to the master's shoes. In short, the house in Seville Row, which must have been a very temple of disorder and unrest under the illustrious but dissipated Sheridan, was coziness, comfort, and method idealized. There was no study, nor were there books, which would have been quite useless to Mr. Fogg, for at the Reform two libraries, one of general literature and the other of law and politics, were at his service. A moderate-sized safe stood in his bedroom, constructed so as to defy fire as well as burglars, but Passepartout found neither arms nor hunting weapons anywhere. Everything betrayed the most tranquil and peaceable habits. Having scrutinized the house from top to bottom, he rubbed his hands, a broad smile overspread his features, and he said joyfully, "'This is just what I wanted. Ah, oh, we shall get on together, Mr. Fogg and I. What a domestic and regular gentleman! A real machine! Well, I don't mind serving a machine.'" End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 in which a conversation takes place which seems likely to cost Phileas Fogg dear. Phileas Fogg, having shut the door of his house at half-past eleven, and having put his right foot before his left five hundred and seventy-five times, and his left foot before his right five hundred and seventy-six times, reached the Reform Club, an imposing edifice in Pall Mall, which could not have cost less than three millions. He repaired at once to the dining-room, the nine windows of which open upon a tasteful garden, where the trees were already gilded with an autumn coloring, and took his place at the habitual table, the cover of which had already been laid for him. His breakfast consisted of a side-dish, a broiled fish with reading sauce, a scarlet slice of roast beef garnished with mushrooms, a rhubarb and gooseberry tart, and a morsel of Cheshire cheese the whole being washed down with several cups of tea, for which the reform is famous. He rose at thirteen minutes to one, and directed his steps towards the large hall, a sumptuous apartment adorned with lavishly framed paintings. A flunkey handed him an uncut times, which he proceeded to cut with a skill which betrayed familiarity with this delicate operation. The perusal of this paper absorbed Phileas Fogg until a quarter before four whilst the standard, his next text, occupied him till the dinner hour. Dinner passed as breakfast had done, and Mr. Fogg reappeared in the reading-room and sat down to the Pall Mall at twenty minutes before six. Half an hour later several members of the Reform came in and drew up to the fireplace, where a coal fire was steadily burning. They were Mr. Fogg's usual partners at whist, Andrew Stewart, an engineer, John Sullivan, and Samuel Fallentine, bankers, 
Thomas Flanagan, a brewer, and Gauthier Ralph, one of the directors of the Bank of England, all rich and highly respectable personages, even in a club which comprises the princes of English trade and finance. "'Well, Ralph,' said Thomas Flanagan, "'what about that robbery?' "'Oh,' replied Stuart, "'the bank will lose the money.' "'On the contrary,' broke in Ralph, "'I hope we may put our hands on the robber. Skillful detectives have been sent to all the principal ports of America and the continent, and he'll be a clever fellow if he slips through their fingers.' "'But have you got the robber's description?' asked Stuart. "'In the first place he is no robber at all,' returned Ralph positively. "'What, a fellow who makes off with fifty-five thousand pounds, no robber? No. Perhaps he's a manufacturer, then. The Daily Telegraph says that he is a gentleman. It was Phileas Fogg, whose head now emerged from behind his newspapers, who made this remark. He bowed to his friends and entered into the conversation. The affair which formed its subject, and which was town talk, had occurred three days before at the Bank of England.' A package of banknotes to the value of fifty-five thousand pounds had been taken from the principal cashier's table, that functionary being at the moment engaged in registering the receipt of three shillings and sixpence. Of course he could not have his eyes everywhere. Let it be observed that the Bank of England reposes a touching confidence in the honesty of the public. There are neither guards nor gratings to protect its treasures. Gold, silver, banknotes are freely exposed at the mercy of the first comer. A keen observer of English customs relates that being in one of the rooms of the bank one day, he had the curiosity to examine a gold ingot weighing some seven or eight pounds. He took it up, scrutinized it, passed it to his neighbor, he to the next man, and so on until the ingot, going from hand to hand, was transferred to the end of a dark entry, nor did it return to its place for half an hour. Meanwhile the cashier had not so much as raised his head. But in the present instance things had not gone so smoothly. The package of notes not being found when five o'clock sounded from the ponderous clock in the drawing office, the amount was passed to the account of profit and loss. As soon as the robbery was discovered, picked detectives hastened off to Liverpool, Glasgow, Harve, Suez, Brindisi, New York, and other ports, inspired by the proffered reward of two thousand pounds and five per cent on the sum that might be recovered. Detectives were also charged with narrowly watching those who arrived at or left London by rail, and a judicial examination was at once entered upon. There were real grounds for supposing, as the Daily Telegraph said, that the thief did not belong to a professional band. On the day of the robbery a well-dressed gentleman of polished manners, and with a well-to-do air, had been observed going to and fro in the paying room where the crime was committed. A description of him was easily procured and sent to the detectives, and some hopeful spirits, of whom Ralph was one, did not despair of his apprehension. The papers and clubs were full of the affair, and everywhere people were discussing the probabilities of a successful pursuit, and the Reform Club was especially agitated, several of its members being bank officials. Ralph would not concede that the work of the detectives was likely to be in vain, for he thought that the prize offered would greatly stimulate their zeal and activity. But Stuart was far from sharing this confidence and as they placed themselves at the whist table, they continued to argue the matter. Stuart and Flanagan played together, while Phileas Fogg had Valentine for his partner. As the game proceeded, the conversation ceased, excepting between the rubbers when it revived again. "'I maintain,' said Stuart, "'that the chances are in favor of the thief who must be a shrewd fellow.' "'Well, but where can he fly to?' asked Ralph. No country is safe for him. Pshaw! Where could he go, then? Oh, I don't know that. The world is big enough. It was once, said Phileas Fogg, in a low tone. Cut, sir, he added, handing the cards to Thomas Flanagan. The discussion fell during the rubber, after which Stuart took up its thread. What do you mean by once? Has the world grown smaller? Certainly, returned Ralph. I agree with Mr. Fogg. The world has grown smaller, since a man can now go round it ten times more quickly than a hundred years ago, 
and that is why the search for this thief will be more likely to succeed, and also why the thief can get away more easily. Be so good as to play, Mr. Stewart, said Phileas Fogg, but the incredulous Stewart was not convinced and when the hand was finished said eagerly, "'You have a strange way, Ralph, of proving that the world has grown smaller. So because you can go round it in three months—' "'In eighty days,' interrupted Phileas Fogg. "'That is true, gentlemen,' added John Sullivan. "'Only eighty days, now that the section between Rothel and Allahabad on the Great Indian Peninsula Railway has been opened. Here is the estimate made by the Daily Telegraph.' From London to Suez via Mont Sinus and Brindisi by rail and steamboats, seven days. From Suez to Bombay by steamer, thirteen days. From Bombay to Calcutta by rail, three days. From Calcutta to Hong Kong by steamer, thirteen days. From Hong Kong to Yokohama, Japan by steamer, six days. From Yokohama to San Francisco by steamer, twenty-two days from San Francisco to New York by rail, seven days, from New York to London by steamer and rail, nine days, total, eighty days. Yes, in eighty days, exclaimed Stuart, who in his excitement made a false deal, but that doesn't take into account bad weather, contrary winds, shipwrecks, railway accidents, and so on. All included, returned Phileas Fogg, continuing to play despite the discussion. "'But suppose the Hindus or Indians pull up the rails,' replied Stuart. "'Suppose they stop the trains, pillage the luggage vans, and scalp the passengers?' "'All included,' calmly retorted Fogg, adding, as he threw down the cards, two trumps. Stuart, whose turn it was to deal, gathered them up and went on. "'You were right, theoretically, Mr. Fogg, but practically—' "'Practically also, Mr. Stuart. "'I'd like to see you do it in eighty days.' It depends on you. Shall we go? Heaven preserve me, but I would wager four thousand pounds that such a journey made under these conditions is impossible. Quite possible, on the contrary, returned Mr. Fogg. Well, make it, then. The journey round the world in eighty days? Yes. I should like nothing better. When? At once. Only I warn you that I shall do it at your expense." "'It's absurd!' cried Stuart, who was beginning to be annoyed at the persistency of his friend. "'Come, let's go on with the game.' "'Deal over again, then,' said Phileas Fogg. "'There's a false deal.' Stuart took up the pack with a feverish hand, then suddenly put them down again. "'Well, Mr. Fogg,' said he, "'it shall be so. I will wager the four thousand on it.' "'Calm yourself, my dear Stuart,' said Valentine. "'It's only a joke.' "'When I say I'll wager,' returned Stuart, "'I mean it.' "'All right,' said Mr. Fogg, and turning to the others he continued, "'I have a deposit of twenty thousand at Bearings, which I will willingly risk upon it.' Twenty thousand pounds!' cried Sullivan. Twenty thousand pounds which you would lose by a single accidental delay?' "'The unforeseen does not exist,' quietly replied Phileas Fogg. "'But, Mr. Fogg, eighty days are only the estimate of the least possible time in which the journey can be made. A well-used minimum suffices for everything. But in order not to exceed it you must jump mathematically from the trains upon the steamers and from the steamers upon the trains again. I will jump mathematically.' "'You are joking!' "'A true Englishman doesn't joke when he is talking about so serious a thing as a wager,' replied Phileas Fogg solemnly. "'I will bet twenty thousand pounds against anyone who wishes that I will make the tour of the world in eighty days or less, in nineteen hundred and twenty hours, or a hundred and fifteen thousand two hundred minutes. Do you accept?' "'We accept,' replied Mr. Stewart, Valentine, Sullivan, Flanagan, and Ralph, after consulting each other. "'Good,' said Mr. Fogg. "'The train leaves for Dover at a quarter before nine. "'I will take it.' "'This very evening?' asked Stuart. "'This very evening,' returned Phileas Fogg. "'He took out and consulted a pocket almanac, and added, "'As today is Wednesday, the 2nd of October, "'I shall be due in London in this very room of the Reform Club "'on Saturday, the 21st of December, at a quarter before nine p.m.' 
or else the twenty thousand pounds now deposited in my name at Baring's will belong to you in fact and in right, gentlemen. Here is a check for the amount. A memorandum of the wager was at once drawn up and signed by the six parties, during which Phileas Fogg preserved a stoical composure. He certainly did not bet to win, and had only staked the twenty thousand pounds, half of his fortune, because he foresaw that he might have to expend the other half to carry out this difficult, not to say unattainable, project. As for his antagonists they seemed much agitated, not so much by the value of their stake, as because they had some scruples about betting under conditions so difficult to their friend. The clock struck seven, and the party offered to suspend the game so that Mr. Fogg might make his preparations for departure. "'I am quite ready now,' was his tranquil response. "'Diamonds or trumps. Be so good as to play, gentlemen.'" End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 In Which Phileas Fogg Astounds Passepartout, His Servant Having won twenty guineas at whist and taken leave of his friends, Phileas Fogg, at twenty-five minutes past seven, left the Reform Club. Passepartout, who had conscientiously studied the program of his duties, was more than surprised to see his master guilty of the inexactness of appearing at this unaccustomed hour for, according to rule, he was not due in Seville Row until precisely midnight. Mr. Fogg repaired to his bedroom and called out, Passepartout! Passepartout did not reply. It could not be he who was called. It was not the right hour. Passepartout! repeated Mr. Fogg, without raising his voice. Passepartout made his appearance. I've called you twice, observed his master. But it is not midnight, responded the other, showing his watch. I know it. I don't blame you. We start for Dover and Calais in ten minutes. A puzzled grin overspread Passepartout's round face. Clearly he had not comprehended his master. Monsieur is going to leave home? Yes, returned Phileas Fogg. We are going round the world. Passepartout opened wide his eyes, raised his eyebrows, held up his hands, and seemed about to collapse. So overcome was he with stupefied astonishment. "'Round the world?' he murmured. "'In eighty days,' responded Mr. Fogg. "'So we haven't a moment to lose.' "'But the trunks,' gasped Passepartout, unconsciously swaying his head from right to left, "'we'll have no trunks, only a carpet-bag with two shirts and three pairs of stockings for me, and the same for you. We'll buy our clothes on the way. Bring down my mackintosh and traveling cloak and some stout shoes, though we shall do little walking.' Make haste. Passepartout tried to reply, but could not. He went out, mounted to his own room, fell into a chair, and muttered, That's good, that is, and I, who wanted to remain quiet. He mechanically set about making the preparations for departure. Around the world in eighty days. Was his master a fool? No. Was this a joke, then? They were going to Dover. Good. To Calais. Good again. After all, Passepartout, who had been away from France five years, would not be sorry to set foot on his native soil again. Perhaps they would go as far as Paris, and it would do his eyes good to see Paris once more, but surely a gentleman so cherry of his steps would stop there, no doubt. But then it was none the less true that he was going away, this so domestic person hitherto. By eight o'clock Passepartout had packed the modest carpet-bag containing the wardrobes of his master and himself. Then, still troubled in mind, he carefully shut the door of his room and descended to Mr. Fogg. Mr. Fogg was quite ready. Under his arm might have been observed a red-bound copy of Bradshaw's Continental Railway, Steam Transit, and General Guide, with its timetable showing the arrival and departure of steamers and railways, he took the carpet-bag, opened it, and slipped into it a goodly roll of Bank of England notes, which would pass wherever he might go. "'You have forgotten nothing?' asked he. "'Nothing, monsieur. My mackintosh and cloak. Here they are. Good. Take this carpet-bag,' handing it to Passepartout. "'Take good care of it, for there are twenty thousand pounds in it.' Passepartout nearly dropped the bag as if the twenty thousand pounds were in gold, and weighed him down. 
master and man then descended the street door was double locked and at the end of seville row they took a cab and drove rapidly to sharing cross the cab stopped before the railway station at twenty minutes past eight passepartout jumped off the box and followed his master who after paying the cabman was about to enter the station when a poor beggar woman with a child in her arms her naked feet smeared with mud her head covered with a wretched bonnet from which hung a tattered feather and her shoulders shrouded in a ragged shawl approached and mournfully asked for alms mr fogg took out the twenty guineas he had just won at whist and handed them to the beggar saying here, my good woman, I'm glad that I met you, and passed on. Passepartout had a moist sensation about the eyes. His master's action touched his susceptible heart. Two first-class tickets for Paris having been speedily purchased, Mr. Fogg was crossing the station to the train when he perceived his five friends of the reform. Well, gentlemen, said he, I'm off, you see and if you will examine my passport when I get back, you will be able to judge whether I have accomplished the journey agreed upon. Oh, that would be quite unnecessary, Mr. Fogg, said Ralph politely. We will trust your word as a gentleman of honor. You do not forget when you are due in London again, asked Stuart. In eighty days, on Saturday, the 21st of December, 1872, at a quarter before nine p.m. Good-bye, gentlemen. Phileas Fogg and his servant seated themselves in a first-class carriage at twenty minutes before nine. Five minutes later the whistle screamed and the train slowly glided out of the station. The night was dark and a fine steady rain was falling. Phileas Fogg, snugly ensconced in his corner, did not open his lips. Passepartout, not yet recovered from his stupefaction, clung mechanically to the carpet-bag with its enormous treasure. Just as the train was whirling through Sydenham, Passepartout suddenly uttered a cry of despair. "'What's the matter?' asked Mr. Fogg. "'Alas! In my hurry I—I I forgot—' "'What?' "'To turn off the gas in my room.' "'Very well, young man,' returned Mr. Fogg coolly. "'It will burn at your expense.'" End of Chapter 4 Chapter 5 in which a new species of funds unknown to the moneyed men appears on change. Phileas Fogg rightly suspected that his departure from London would create a lively sensation at the West End. The news of the bet spread through the Reform Club and afforded an exciting topic of conversation to its members. From the club it soon got into the papers throughout England. The boasted tour of the world was talked about, disputed, argued with as much warmth as if the subject were another Alabama claim. Some took sides with Phileas Fogg, but the large majority shook their heads and declared against him. It was absurd, impossible, they declared, that the tour of the world could be made, except theoretically and on paper, in this minimum of time, and with the existing means of traveling. The Times, Standard, Morning Post, and Daily News, and twenty other highly respectable newspapers scouted Mr. Fogg's project as madness. The Daily Telegraph alone hesitatingly supported him. People in general thought him a lunatic, and blamed his Reform Club friends for having accepted a wager which betrayed the mental aberration of its proposer. Articles no less passionate than logical appeared on the question for geography is one of the pet subjects of the English, and the columns devoted to Phileas Fogg's venture were eagerly devoured by all classes of readers. At first some rash individuals, principally of the gentler sex, espoused his cause, which became still more popular when the illustrated London news came out with his portrait, copied from a photograph in the Reform Club. A few readers of the Daily Telegraph even dared to say, Why not, after all? Stranger things have come to pass. At last a long article appeared on the 7th of October in the Bulletin of the Royal Geographical Society, which treated the question from every point of view and demonstrated the utter folly of the enterprise. Everything, it said, was against the travelers, every obstacle imposed alike by man and by nature. A miraculous agreement of the times of departure and arrival, which was impossible, was absolutely necessary to his success. He might perhaps reckon on the arrival of trains at the designated hours in Europe, where the distances were relatively moderate, 
but when he calculated upon crossing India in three days, and the United States in seven, could he rely beyond misgiving upon accomplishing his task? There were accidents to machinery, the liability of trains to run off the line, collisions, bad weather, the blocking up by snow. Were not all these against Phileas Fogg? Would he not find himself when traveling by steamer in winter at the mercy of the winds and fogs? Is it uncommon for the best ocean steamers to be two or three days behind time? But a single delay would suffice to fatally break the chain of communication. Should Phileas Fogg once miss, even by an hour, a steamer, he would have to wait for the next, and that would irrevocably render his attempt vain. This article made a great deal of noise, and being copied into all the papers seriously depressed the advocates of the rash tourist. Everybody knows that England is the world of betting men, who are of a higher class than mere gamblers. To bet is in the English temperament. Not only the members of the reform, but the general public made heavy wagers for or against Phileas Fogg, who was set down in the betting books as if he were a racehorse. Bonds were issued and made their appearance on change. Phileas Fogg bonds were offered at par or at a premium, and a great business was done in them but five days after the article in the bulletin of the Geographical Society appeared, the demand began to subside. Phileas Fogg declined. They were offered by packages at first of five, then of ten, until at last nobody would take less than twenty, fifty, a hundred. Lord Albemarle, an elderly paralytic gentleman, was now the only advocate of Phileas Fogg left. This noble lord, who was fastened to his chair, would have given his fortune to be able to make the tour of the world if it took ten years, and he bet five thousand pounds on Phileas Fogg. When the folly as well as the uselessness of the adventure was pointed out to him, he contented himself with replying, If the thing is feasible, the first to do it ought to be an Englishman. The Fogg party dwindled more and more. Everybody was going against him and the bet stood a hundred and fifty and two hundred to one, and a week after his departure an incident occurred which deprived him of backers at any price. The commissioner of police was sitting in his office at nine o'clock one evening when the following telegraphic dispatch was put into his hands. Suez to London. Rowan, commissioner of police, Scotland Yard. I found the bank robber, Phileas Fogg. Send without delay warrant of arrest to Bombay. Fix, detective. The effect of this dispatch was instantaneous. The polished gentleman disappeared to give place to the bank robber. His photograph, which was hung with those of the rest of the members of the Reform Club, was minutely examined, and it betrayed feature by feature the description of the robber which had been provided to the police. The mysterious habits of Phileas Fogg were recalled, his solitary ways, his sudden departure, and it seemed clear that in undertaking a tour round the world on the pretext of a wager he had had no other end in view than to elude the detectives and throw them off his track. End of chapter 5 Chapter 6 In Which Fix the Detective Betrays a Very Natural Impatience The circumstances under which this telegraphic dispatch about Phileas Fogg was sent were as follows. The steamer Mongolia, belonging to the Peninsular and Oriental Company, built of iron, of 2,800 tons burden and 500 horsepower, was due at 11 o'clock a.m. on Wednesday the 9th of October at Suez. The Mongolia plied regularly between Brindisi and Bombay via the Suez Canal, and was one of the fastest steamers belonging to the company always making more than ten knots an hour between Brindisi and Suez, and nine and a half between Suez and Bombay. Two men were promenading up and down the wharves, among the crowd of natives and strangers who were sojourning at this once straggling village, now thanks to the enterprise of M. Lessops, a fast-growing town. One was the British consul at Suez, who, despite the prophecies of the English government, and the unfavorable predictions of Stephenson, was in the habit of seeing from his office window English ships daily passing to and fro on the Great Canal, by which the old roundabout route from England to India by the Cape of Good Hope was abridged by at least a half. 
The other was a small, slight-built personage with a nervous, intelligent face and bright eyes peering out from under eyebrows which he was incessantly twitching. He was just now manifesting unmistakable signs of impatience, nervously pacing up and down, and unable to stand still for a moment. This was Fix, one of the detectives who had been dispatched from England in search of the bank robber. It was his task to narrowly watch every passenger who arrived at Suez, and to follow up all who seemed to be suspicious characters, or bore a resemblance to the description of the criminal which he had received two days before from the police headquarters at London. The detective was evidently inspired by the hope of obtaining the splendid reward which would be the prize of success, and awaited with feverish impatience, easy to understand, the arrival of the steamer Mongolia. "'So you say, Consul,' asked he for the twentieth time, "'that this steamer is never behind time?' "'No, Mr. Fix,' replied the consul. "'She was bespoken yesterday at Port Said, "'and the rest of the way is of no account to such a craft. "'I repeat that the Mongolia has been in advance "'of the time required by the company's regulations, "'and gained the prize awarded for excess of speed. "'Does she come directly from Brindisi?' "'Directly from Brindisi. "'She takes on the Indian mails there, "'and she left there Saturday at 5 p.m. "'Have patience, Mr. Fix. She will not be late. But really I don't see how, from the description you have, you will be able to recognize your man, even if he is on board the Mongolia. A man rather feels the presence of these fellows, Consul, than recognizes them. You must have a scent for them, and a scent is like a sixth sense which combines hearing, seeing, and smelling. I've arrested more than one of these gentlemen in my time, and if my thief is on board I'll answer for it. He'll not slip through my fingers. I hope so, Mr. Fix, for it was a heavy robbery. A magnificent robbery, Consul. Fifty-five thousand pounds. We don't often have such windfalls. Burglars are getting to be so contemptible nowadays. A fellow gets hung for a handful of shillings. Mr. Fix, said the Consul, I like your way of talking, and hope you'll succeed. But I fear you will find it far from easy. Don't you see, the description which you have there has a singular resemblance to an honest man. Consul, remarked the detective dogmatically, great robbers always resemble honest folk. Fellows who have rascally faces have only one course to take, and that is to remain honest, otherwise they would be arrested offhand. The artistic thing is to unmask honest countenances. It's no light task, I admit, but a real art. Mr. Fix evidently was not wanting in a tinge of self-conceit. Little by little the scene on the quay became more animated. Sailors of various nations, merchants, shipbrokers, porters, fellows, bustled to and fro as if the steamer were immediately expected. The weather was clear and slightly chilly. The minarets of the town loomed above the houses in the pale rays of the sun. A jetty pier, some two thousand yards along, extended into the roadstead. A number of fishing smacks and coasting boats, some retaining the fantastic fashion of ancient galleys, were discernible on the Red Sea. As he passed among the busy crowd, Fix, according to habit, scrutinized the passers-by with a keen, rapid glance. It was now half-past ten. "'The steamer doesn't come!' he exclaimed as the port clock struck. "'She can't be far off now,' returned his companion. "'How long will she stop at Suez?' Four hours, long enough to get in her coal. It is thirteen hundred and ten miles from Suez to Aden, at the other end of the Red Sea, and she has to take in a fresh supply of coal. "'And does she go from Suez directly to Bombay?' "'Without putting in anywhere.' "'Good,' said Fix. If the robber is on board, he will no doubt get off at Suez, so as to reach the Dutch or French colonies in Asia by some other route. He ought to know that he would not be safe an hour in India, which is English soil. Unless, objected the consul, he is exceptionally shrewd. An English criminal, you know, is always better concealed in London than anywhere else. This observation furnished the detective food for thought, and meanwhile the consul went away to his office. Fix, left alone, was more impatient than ever, having a presentiment that the robber was on board the Mongolia. 
If he had indeed left London intending to reach the New World, he would naturally take the route via India, which was less watched and more difficult to watch than that of the Atlantic. But Fix's reflections were soon interrupted by a succession of sharp whistles, which announced the arrival of the Mongolia. The porters and fellas rushed down the quay, and a dozen boats pushed off from the shore to go and meet the steamer. Soon her gigantic hull appeared passing along between the banks, and eleven o'clock struck as she anchored in the road. She brought an unusual number of passengers, some of whom remained on deck to scan the picturesque panorama of the town, while the greater part disembarked in the boats and landed on the quay. Fix took up a position and carefully examined each face and figure which made its appearance. Presently one of the passengers, after vigorously pushing his way through the importunate crowd of porters, came up to him and politely asked him if he could point out the English consulate, at the same time showing a passport which he wished to have visaed. Fix instinctively took the passport and with a rapid glance read the description of its bearer. An involuntary motion of surprise nearly escaped him, for the description in the passport was identical with that of the bank robber which he had received from Scotland Yard. "'Is this your passport?' asked he. "'No, it's my master's.' "'And your master is? He stayed on board.' "'But he must go to the consul's in person, so as to establish his identity. Oh, is that necessary? Quite indispensable. And where is the consulate?' "'There, on the corner of the square,' said Fix, pointing to a house two hundred steps off. "'I'll go and fetch my master, who won't be much pleased, however, to be disturbed.' The passenger bowed to Fix and returned to the steamer. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7, which once more demonstrates the uselessness of passports as aids to detectives. The detective passed down the quay and rapidly made his way to the consul's office, where he was at once admitted to the presence of that official. Consul, said he, without preamble, I have strong reasons for believing that my man is a passenger on the Mongolia, and he narrated what had just passed concerning the passport. Well, Mr. Fix, replied the consul, I shall not be sorry to see the rascal's face, but perhaps he won't come here. "'that is, if he is the person you suppose him to be. "'A robber doesn't quite like to leave traces of his flight behind him, "'and besides he is not obliged to have his passport countersigned. "'If he is as shrewd as I think he is, Consul, he will come. "'To have his passport visaed? "'Yes, passports are only good for annoying honest folks "'and aiding in the flight of rogues. "'I assure you it will be quite the thing for him to do.' but I hope you will not visa the passport. Why not? If the passport is genuine, I have no right to refuse. Still, I must keep this man here until I can get a warrant to arrest him from London. Ah, that's your lookout, but I cannot— The consul did not finish his sentence, for as he spoke, a knock was heard at the door, and two strangers entered, one of whom was the servant whom Fix had met on the quay. The other, who was his master, held out his passport with the request that the consul would do him the favor to visa it. The consul took the document and carefully read it, whilst Fix observed, or rather devoured, the stranger with his eyes from a corner of the room. "'You are Mr. Phileas Fogg,' said the consul, after reading the passport. "'I am. And this man is your servant. He is a Frenchman named Passepartout. You are from London?' "'Yes.' and you are going to Bombay. Very good, sir. You know that a visa is useless and that no passport is required? I know it, sir, replied Phileas Fogg, but I wish to prove by your visa that I came by Suez. Very well, sir. The consul proceeded to sign and date the passport, after which he added his official seal. Mr. Fogg paid the customary fee, coldly bowed, and went out, followed by his servant. Well, queried the detective. Well, he looks and acts like a perfectly honest man, replied the consul. Possibly, but that is not the question. Do you think, consul, that this phlegmatic gentleman resembles, feature by feature, the robber whose description I have received? I concede that, but then, you know, all descriptions— I'll make certain of it, interrupted Fix. The servant seems to me less mysterious than the master— Besides, he's a Frenchman and can't help talking. 
"'Excuse me for a little while, Consul,' Fix started off in search of past partout. Meanwhile Mr. Fogg, after leaving the consulate, repaired to the quay, gave some orders to Passepartout, went off to the Mongolia in a boat, and descended to his cabin. He took up his notebook, which contained the following memoranda. Left London Wednesday, October 2nd, at 8.45 p.m. Reached Paris Thursday, October 3rd, at 7.20 a.m. Left Paris Thursday at 8.40 a.m., Reached Turin by Mont Cenis Friday, October 4th at 6.35 a.m. Left Turin Friday at 7.20 a.m. Arrived at Brindisi Saturday, October 5th at 4 p.m. Sailed on the Mongolia Saturday at 5 p.m. Reached Suez Wednesday, October 9th at 11 a.m. Total of hours spent 158 plus, or in days six days and a half. These dates were inscribed in an itinerary divided into columns, indicating the month, the day of the month, and the day for the stipulated and actual arrivals at each principal point, Paris, Brindisi, Suez, Bombay, Calcutta, Singapore, Hong Kong, Yokohama, San Francisco, New York, and London, from the 2nd of October to the 21st of December, and giving a space for setting down the gain made or the loss suffered on arrival at each locality. This methodical record thus contained an account of everything needed, and Mr. Fogg always knew whether he was behind hand or in advance of his time. On this Friday, October 9th, he noted his arrival at Suez, and observed that he had as yet neither gained nor lost. He sat down quietly to breakfast in his cabin, never once thinking of inspecting the town, being one of those Englishmen who were wont to see foreign countries through the eyes of their domestics. End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 In which Passepartout talks rather more, perhaps, than is prudent. Fix soon rejoined Passepartout, who was lounging and looking about on the quay, as if he did not feel that he, at least, was obliged not to see anything. "'Well, my friend,' said the detective, coming up with him, "'is your passport beset? "'Ah, oh, it's you, is it, monsieur?' responded Passepartout. "'Thanks. Yes, the passport is all right. "'And are you looking about you?' "'Yes, but we travel so fast that I seem to be journeying in a dream. "'So this is Suez?' "'Yes. In Egypt?' "'Certainly in Egypt. And in Africa?' "'In Africa.' "'In Africa,' repeated Passepartout. "'Just think, monsieur, I had no idea that we should go farther than Paris, and all that I saw of Paris was between twenty minutes past seven and twenty minutes before nine in the morning, between the northern and the lion's stations, through the windows of a car, and in a driving rain. How I regret not having seen once more Père Lachey and the circus in the Champs-Élysées. "'You are in a great hurry, then?' "'I am not, but my master is.' "'By the way, I must buy some shoes and shirts. "'We came away without trunks, only with a carpet-bag. "'I will show you an excellent shop for getting what you want. "'Really, monsieur, you are very kind.' "'And they walked off together, past Partout, chatting volubly as they went along. "'Above all,' said he, "'don't let me lose the steamer. "'You have plenty of time. It's only twelve o'clock.' "'Past Partout pulled out his big watch. Twelve he exclaimed. Why, it's only eight minutes before ten. Your watch is slow. My watch? A family watch, monsieur, which has come down from my great-grandfather. It doesn't vary five minutes in the year. It's a perfect chronometer. Look you. I see how it is, said Fix. You have kept London time, which is two hours behind that of Suez. You ought to regulate your watch at noon in each country. I regulate my watch? Never! "'Well, then, it will not agree with the sun. "'So much the worse for the sun, monsieur. "'The sun will be wrong, then.' "'And the worthy fellow returned the watch to its fob with a defiant gesture. "'After a few minutes' silence, Fix resumed. "'You left your London hastily, then?' "'I rather think so. "'Last Friday at eight o'clock in the evening, "'Monsieur Fogg came home from his club, "'and three-quarters of an hour afterwards we were off. "'But where is your master going?' always straight ahead. He is going round the world. Round the world, cried Fix. Yes, and in eighty days. He says it is on a wager, but between us I don't believe a word of it. 
That wouldn't be common sense. There's something else in the wind. Ah, Mr. Fogg is a character, is he? I should say he was. Is he rich? No doubt, for he is carrying an enormous sum in brand new banknotes with him. And he doesn't spare the money on the way, either. He has offered a large reward to the engineer of the Mongolia if he gets us to Bombay well in advance of time. And you have known your master a long time? Why, no, I entered his service the very day we left London. The effect of these replies upon the already suspicious and excited detective may be imagined. The hasty departure from London soon after the robbery, the large sum carried by Mr. Fogg, the eagerness to reach distant countries, the pretext of an eccentric and foolhardy bet, all confirmed fix in his theory. He continued to pump poor Passepartout, and learned that he really knew little or nothing of his master who lived a solitary existence in London, was said to be rich, though no one knew whence came his riches, and was mysterious and impenetrable in his affairs and habits. Fix felt sure that Phileas Fogg would not land at Suez, but was really going on to Bombay. "'Is Bombay far from here?' asked Passepartout. "'Pretty far. It is a ten days' voyage by sea. And in what country is Bombay? India? In Asia? Certainly. The deuce! I was going to tell you there's one thing that worries me. My burner. What burner?' my gas-burner, which I forgot to turn off, and which is at this moment burning at my expense. I have calculated, monsieur, that I lose two shillings every four and twenty hours, exactly sixpence more than I earn, and you will understand that the longer our journey did Fix pay any attention to Passepartout's trouble about the gas. It is not probable. He was not listening, but was cogitating a project. Passepartout and he had now reached the shop, where Fix left his companion to make his purchases, after recommending him not to miss the steamer, and hurried back to the consulate. Now that he was fully convinced, Fix had quite recovered his equanimity. Consul, said he, I have no longer any doubt. I have spotted my man. He passes himself off as an odd stick who is going round the world in eighty days. Then he's a sharp fellow, returned the consul, and counts on returning to London after putting the police of the two countries off his track. We'll see about that, replied Fix. But are you not mistaken? I am not mistaken. Why was this robber so anxious to prove by the visa that he had passed through Suez? Why, I have no idea. But listen to me. He reported in a few words the most important parts of his conversation with Passepartout. "'In short,' said the consul, "'appearances are wholly against this man. "'And what are you going to do? "'Send a dispatch to London "'for a warrant of arrest "'to be dispatched instantly to Bombay. "'Take passage on board the Mongolia, "'follow my road to India, "'and there, on English ground, "'arrest him politely, "'with my warrant in my hand "'and my hand on his shoulder.' Having uttered these words with a cool, careless air, the detective took leave of the consul and repaired to the telegraph office, whence he sent the dispatch which we have seen to the London police office. A quarter of an hour later found Fix with a small bag in his hand, proceeding on board the Mongolia, and ere many moments longer the noble steamer rode out at full steam upon the waters of the Red Sea. End of chapter 8